for six months to see if we like it, how we like it. Some folks have already responded. There's just uh, bukus of information on this right now, media. And Brother John, are we up and going on that? Yeah. Uh, let's pull that up. Let me get my bullet behind you back here. Right there behind you. Make sure I got what I can take. Just to give you a little bit of a demonstration. And then also, uh, well, I'll get that before we uh, leave here. Uh, right now, media, you can go onto it. How many of you have gotten an invitation on, through your email? You got an invitation? Okay, good. If you have it, you probably will. And if you want to and you haven't given that to us, then just use this little tear off thing on the bulletin. And if you want to know how to tear that off, Robert. Good, that means you can do it. Tear it off, put your email down there, and place it up there at the sound booth, and uh, we'll have your email add you to the list. And we'll talk more about adding other people as we go along. Uh, but here we are, John. And uh, so you can pull up the rightnowmedia.org, and uh, it'll look something like this. Uh, there's a, a place that says browse up top. Pick in here anywhere, John, and speak as you please, okay. buddy. And so when you hit browse, then you'll see that there's uh, different speakers and writers and authors and those, those things and different categories. All Bible studies and Bible studies from many different places and books. And uh, which one are we going to choose today, John? Uh, Christian Living. Christian Living. That's a good category. Y'all need to pay attention to that. <laughs> Christian Living. Uh, there's Max Licato, Lucado. And uh, you can just go through and see what he has available at different things. Most of us love to travel. What we hate is the baggage we're lugging around. What if we could travel through life with no bags at all? I'm Max Locato. And I've never been one to travel life, but I need to learn. Lots of journey. And it's easy to pick up extra baggage along the way. Bitterness and guilt. Self-reliance and pride. How can we enjoy the road ahead? So this is his uh, presentation on, on traveling life, getting rid of baggage, and how, how to handle those things. All kinds. Most of, of us love to travel. There, uh, all kinds of things for parents and grandparents, and uh, different studies. Anything else particular there, John? No, just um, the best thing you can do is just go in and play with it. You can't hurt anything. There you go. Did you know uh, many wonderful yeah. Bible studies, uh, extra things, illustrations, devotionals. They're good devotionals. There's even, once you sign up on this, you could go with, like, you, uh, I and three of you could decide, hey, look, we want to study something, meet together, and so we can uh, load it and then interact together on it different ways. There's different things that I've read that they're sending to us. Right now, media, try it out, see what it looks like. And uh, we'll talk more about it. Now, starting tomorrow uh, is a special week of emphasis for praying for our missionaries, our mission work. And so we meet Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Tomorrow, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, right over here in this classroom of Mr. Owings. And we meet at 10 o'clock. encourage all of you to come. Uh, it's an encouraging time to see what's happening, but it's also a time that we can pray for the God's work to be done around the world. And uh, there's always a need for that. It's a privilege that we can uh, join together and do that. Okay. Okay, Brother Robert, if you would come, please. We're going to have our scripture reading. It's from John chapter 13. Brother Robert will be reading and then leading us in prayer. Thank you, Brother Robert. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, 
and that he had come from God and was going to God. Rose from the hem, rose himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he, he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, you wash at my feet. Jesus answered and said to him, what, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he who is he who is bathed only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord. You say, Well, for, I, for so I am. But if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. <clears throat> Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. And we thank you this morning that we can gather in your house here and, and, and share your word with each other. And certainly learn <clears throat> and learn from here your word. We ask you to be with each person here. Let us all gain some knowledge from your word this morning. From what the pastor has to say to lead us, the choir, the music, Lord, everything that said and done may bring honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good morning. How's everybody doing today?
much for that day. Applause, I hope that applause was not for us, but for Jesus. And thank you, Jesus, for giving your life to death for us. And for living again, rising up from the dead and living again. He's not dead, he's alive. And he lives in the each of us. And we're thankful that we have enlarged our choir. We have our newest member, Tegan, and we just want to have a lot of We thank her for joining us. So I want to tell everybody, it doesn't matter what age you are, or if you can sing or not. Just making a joyful noise unto the Lord is what we ask for. Let's all stand and sing our offering song, The Solid Rock, <clears throat> hymn number 526, and we're going to sing hymn number uh, verses 1, 2, and 4. <laughs>
It's good to see you today. Good to be here with you. We sung about the Lord Jesus. Thank you for that. Uh, what a wonderful Savior. We're going to be looking at an incident in the life of our Savior that he did, that he planned, that he had a purpose for, that he accomplished, that he explained, and um, that he lived for us. How about that? For us to do just like he did. If I've done this, he said, then you ought to do it. If I've done it for you, you ought to do it for each other. Let's see what that is. That's in the book of John. Now, I think it was about last January, and I began preaching through the Gospel of Mark. You remember that? And then we took some time off, like remember the month of March. It was March 4th, March in Unity, March in Love, other things. So I sort of veered off of the Mark uh, sermons and covered that. And then we veered off a little bit here and there on different things, Christmas time. But by and large, we covered the book of Mark, finished it up last Sunday. So what are we going to do now? Between now and Resurrection Day. Well, I prayed about it and feel led to uh, just pick up in the one who wrote the most about uh, Jesus, and that was John. At least he wrote the most about Jesus in his last week. And so uh, I'll be covering that. Um, it, it has 16 chapters. And um, I'll talk about and six of those chapters are talking about what Jesus did the last week of his life here. And, of course, after he arose from the dead, you know, he appeared and there's more there. John writes more about that week than anybody else. In John chapter 13, uh, he was observing Friday or Thursday night, Passover. And um, that's what our passage is about. And so we'll cover that, but I'm also going to cover... Not only uh, this message today, which has to do with him washing the disciples' feet. Uh, but we're also going to look at, at uh, next week. Let's see what I have here. We're going to look at the Trinity. When you think, well, what about the Trinity? Well, J John talked a lot about the Holy Spirit coming in John chapter 14. We're in chapter 13 this morning. John 14. John 15 talks a lot about the Trinity in that it talks... Yeah, he talks about the Trinity, the, the Holy Spirit. And, of course, talks about Jesus, the Son of God. And, of course, talks about the Father of God, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, the Trinity. We'll be talk, looking at that um, next week. And then John chapter 17 is Jesus' prayer. Now, we know the Lord's Prayer. We're going to look at that uh, tonight. Talk about praying. Uh, but John chapter 17 is Jesus' prayer to the Father. And we're going to look about that on that uh, one Sunday morning. And then we'll go back to chapter 15 and look at the, the vine. You are the vine. Uh, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. We'll look at that and the significance there. And then the next Sunday, it'll be Resurrection Day. And we'll, of course, talk about the resurrection of our Lord. So that's the plan, all right? We'll see if that plan brings out, comes out, uh, bears forth fruit, and it, it actually happens. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John writes more different things than the other three. Uh, the other three are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So, uh, John, uh, Mark, we read Mark. Mark talked about the this week in six chapters. So did Luke, six chapters. Matthew talked about this week using eight chapters. And John talked about this week, the last week of Jesus' life and after the resurrection, using ten chapters. So there's a lot more there in the book of John. So Robert read that with us. I hope you have your Bibles and ready to look together as we consider this uh, particular incident in the life of Jesus. So we've read those verses. And uh, it starts off with in, in verse 1. Now the, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that the his hour had come that he should depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Verse 2, and supper being ended. So this was that Thursday night, which would have technically been on Friday because the Jewish day began 
at sundown uh, of what you might call the day before. And so it, Thursday had come and gone. It was dark now. It was after 6 p.m. ish. And so now it was into the Passover. And Jesus was observing the Passover meal with his disciples. So there were 13 in the room the 12 disciples and Jesus himself. It was the same night uh, that he uh, washed feet, as we're going to read here. It was the same night of the meal that they had observed in the upper room. It was the same night that Jesus introduced, at the end of that meal, Jesus introduced the Lord's Supper with the bread and the wine. It was the same night where he went with his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane and prayed. And he ended up saying, not my will, but thy will be done. He surrendered and went with the plan of salvation. Aren't you glad he did? Not your will. Not my human feelings about what I'm going through as, as a human. But what I know is spiritually true and eternally true. Father, may your will be done. And he gave himself for us. Oh, what a Savior. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Thank the Lord that he did that. And so it was on that same night that uh, we're reading about tonight. And so what did he do? Let's look at verses 4 through 6. What was it? Here it is, verse 4. He rose from supper, and he laid aside his garments. He took a towel and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. And then verse 6. And then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said, Lord, are you washing my feet? So what did Jesus do? What actually happened? What was done? Um, he washed the disciples' feet. He took a basin. Uh, a basin would be something like a, a large dish, I guess. Um, I think when I was a kid, uh, I remember the number two wash tubs. You remember those? The number two. That was a wash tub. I, he didn't grab that that night, I'm sure. Uh, although, I, how, many, how many of us have taken a bath in a number two wash tub? Amen. Yeah, wonderful. Generally, on the back porch. Right? Because you didn't have running water on the inside. At least in my grandma's house, he did uh, one of my grandmas, anyway. So he didn't use a number two wash tub. They used number two wash tubs in Vermont? Okay, I figured they probably did. <laughs> um, and then we had uh, a foot tub. Now, you know, that sounds like something you wash your feet in, but uh, the foot tub is about a cubic foot, right? I don't know if it was half of a number two tub or not. Uh, but I can picture him getting, picking up that kind of a bucket or a tub or something of that size anyway. And he washed the disciples' feet. Now, I don't know where he started. They were sitting eating a meal. And I learned something this week uh, that makes plenty of sense. They reclined at the meal. Okay? So reclining would be stretching out, leaning <coughs> on one hand, and eating with the other. Right? And he thinks he's got to go somewhere. But there's other people at the table, so you don't have them in the next chair, right? <laughs> and they didn't have the chairs, probably. A bench, and if I was at my grandma's house and sitting on that bench that I love to sit on, why? Because it's different, right? It, you know, instead of sitting in a chair, I got to sit on the bench. And my brothers and sisters, they had to have room to sit, too. So I didn't lay down and stick, you know, stretch my feet out there. They would sort of lean and their feet toward the back. Um... And so, in that case, remember that Peter had asked John, for John to ask Jesus, who's going to be the betrayer? Who's betraying him? This was another part of the night. And John was leaning on Jesus' breast. And so, if I'm Jesus laying here at the table, here, then John's laying right about here. And if he wants to ask me something... He could just lay his head right there and ask me, right? And it could be sort of private. If that's the case, then where was Peter? Well, I'm thinking 
And I read, I think that Judas was sitting on this side of Jesus. Because Ju Jesus said something to Judas and nobody else heard it or knew what it was at the time. But then where was Peter? Uh, one scenario is this, is that they had a table, sort of like we have in our Sunday school class, with one end open, like a horseshoe. Had a table coming around Peter, and Peter was on the end. At least that's what some people think. He may not have been like that. He's on the end. He asked John, who was on the end, hey, John, ask the group. John leans and asks Jesus who it was. He said, it's who I sopped with, put the bread in. And Judas is scared probably here. The rest of them are around here. I don't know, but that makes sense to me uh, that they would be sitting on this side. And so Jesus gets up from the meal. Probably the meal part of it was still going on. He gets up, he goes over, and he takes off his outer clothes. Uh, however different many garments they had there. And um, then he grabs a towel and ties that towel around himself or drapes it or whatever. And immediately, the picture shows that Jesus was doing something that they never expected him to do, right? Because that's what, in, in nice homes, the people that were <coughs> higher than the peasant people, maybe even some of them, the, that's what the service did. They would use that towel and put around them. And uh, that's what Jesus was doing. He got up at supper, and he goes, and he gets dressed, and he gets a basin, probably not a number two wash stuff, certainly not a, not even a foot tub, but he gets a basin, and pours the water in it, and he begins to wash the disciples' feet. I think it's likely he began with Peter, but I know you can read it different ways as you look at it. That doesn't really matter. What did he do? He washed their feet. Now, let's talk about what that washing feet is. Um, everybody walked on dusty Dirt roads. Everybody's feet, most of them, use sandals and their feet got dirty. So we know it's a practical thing. When you come into somebody's house, you take off your sandals and generally you would wash your feet. You'd rinse them off. It would sort of be like mom calls us in to go eat and we come running in the house, grab and go to sit down at the table and grab us a chicken leg. We hadn't prayed yet. I know we knew that, but anyway, we were hoping we'd get ready to anyway. And she said, wait a minute, go wash up. We needed to wash up. And so when people came into Saul's house, they would need to wash the nastiness off of their feet. So it was a necessity to, to have your feet washed or you wash your feet. If you went to visit somebody's house, you need to make sure that you didn't bring in a dirt, mud, and so forth. And so it's a necessity. What was being done? It was being done to clean. The idea was to clean the feet. And so, uh, if the guest went in, he was responsible to do it. But in the great hospitality of the Middle East, when you had a guest in, you treated them royally, took care of them. And so, many times the owner or the, the one who had done the inviting was ready and met them at the door and said, Man, I'm so glad to have you. And he would provide it for them, or he would wash them himself. And as time goes on, I can imagine that sort of developed where... Hey, I'll just have my servants do that. And a lot of times the servants did it. But whatever the case was, the guest knew he needed his feet washed. He would do it himself. I know if you watch The Chosen uh, movie and uh, series that's going on, you'll see that when Peter goes into his house, he takes his sandals off, and then he, he gets some water in a basin, and he wipes his feet off before going any further. He did it himself. But that was his own house when I saw that. Um, but the guest knew that he needed to wash up. He needed to have his feet washed. So I suppose that it became more of a tradition that somebody would greet the guest and wash it for them. But tonight, in the upper room, where Jesus was hosting the Passover meal as the host, he had invited his 12 disciples to be in there. And here he, does. he gets up himself, and he goes... To wash the feet. Now the purpose was what? The purpose that Jesus did that was to get the feet clean. The purpose, you could say the purpose was to show that he was a servant. Well, it does show that he's a servant, but the purpose was to wash feet. I send you to the bathroom, my mom would say, I send you to the bathroom and wash your hands. 
Don't run in there and do something else. Just wash your hands, please. Come on. It was, it was to get clean. The purpose was not hospitality. Hospitality developed after there was a need, and the need was wash up. Um, and so as the host would provide that, the host would show honor to that guest by providing something or even washing his own feet for washing his feet for him. Uh, he made their feet clean. So Jesus cleaned up the feet of his disciples. Now we can move on to what was Jesus teaching during that time? Uh, let's look at that as well. And let's look at verse 7. Verse 7. So Peter said, are you washing my feet? Verse 7. Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. So Jesus said to him, I am going to teach you something, but you don't understand it right away. Now if the only purpose was, was washing his feet, he would have known that immediately. And I know what you're doing, you're washing my feet. But there's a meaning behind it, right? And Jesus said, you're going to understand it later on. Verse 8, Peter said to him, and you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, don't you love this? Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. If that's what it is, if I'm not going to have a part of you unless you wash me, wash me, and wash me good. Cover everything. Do it all, not just my feet. I want to be with you, Lord. I want to have a part with you. Jesus, Peter had his heart right, didn't he? And he said, but my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, so what was Jesus teaching? Well, he's part of this is his teaching. He said, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet. But he's completely clean, and you're clean, but not all of you. Now quickly, the not all of you referred to Judas Iscariot. Judas, there were two Judases on, in the disciples, but one was Judas, the son of Iscariot, who was also uh, the son of Simon as well. So Judas, from the area of Iscariot, his father was Simon. He was not clean. Jesus said, you're all clean. Uh, one of you is not clean. And he had to be referring to Judas. You're already clean. So you don't need me to wash your hands also, Peter. You don't need me to wash your head also. You just need your feet washed. Because you're already clean. <clears throat> so Jesus knew what was going on. Of course, he knew that he was going to be heading to the cross. And uh, he knew that he was in charge. In verses 6 through 9, we talk about Peter uh, being there. And uh, the Lord starts to wash his feet and he questions him. And so basically in verse 10, Jesus tells him, you're already clean, Peter, so you just need your feet washed. You've already had a bath. Now how in the world had Peter had a bath? Because Jesus had cleaned him spiritually. Amen? He hadn't shed his blood for him yet, but it was as good as done. Right? He's clean. Like Abraham was clean. Like David was clean. Esther. You're already clean. All of you are clean. Why? How did they get clean? And Judas Iscariot did not get clean. They believed him. They believed he was the Messiah. They believed and they trusted in Jesus the way that Judas Iscariot did not. In fact, by this time, the devil had already entered into the heart of Judas Iscariot, and Jesus knew that. Oh, by the way, Judas was in line with the twelve and got his feet <coughs> Anyway, so Jesus said, you're already clean, but you only need, you only need to have your feet washed. That's all you need. And I think we would fall in that category. Those of us who are believers, those of us who joined with Jesus, those of us who received eternal life, thank you, Lord, then we're clean. But we would fall in that category of those disciples, then we need our feet washed too. Then what does that mean? I think that's extended teaching here that Jesus 
gives ear. And so let's look at that in verse 12. Verse 12. So when he had washed their feet, and taken back up his garments, and he sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? Probably not. You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you, all, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do as I have done. So we know Jesus washed the feet. We know Jesus was teaching that they only needed the feet washed. What else? What's, what's the further application for us? And that's what I want us to look at here. Um, Jesus' disciples would minister to one another, but not by giving them a bath. You catch the comparison there? Okay? I'm not talking about actually the shower, the bath, or the tub, or anything like that. I'm talking about a spiritual bath. Jesus is the only one that could bathe the disciples. And he'd done that, except for Judas, because Judas didn't believe. And so, Jesus does that. But how were they going to wash each other's feet? If they weren't going to carry a basin around and wash their feet over and over again, and that's not what Jesus meant here. There's no other example shown of that in the scriptures here. How are they going to do that? What's the application? How can you and I fulfill the role of a disciple of Jesus like Jesus meant for them to? Well, I think we continue to look at what he's saying to them. What would be their ministry to one another? You ought to wash one another's feet. What's he mean by that? I think he means, and I'll just go ahead and get to the point. I think he means that they're to wash each other's feet because they love one another. Because they love one another. And loving one another means that we edify each other and we motivate one another. We stir each other up to good works, to godly living, and to even have confessions and repentance. Washing another's feet symbolizing that we are cleansed after salvation. Now you and I get our feet dirty, so to speak, spiritually. You and I still sin, huh? Yeah, we do. If we say you have no sin, we're lying. But we do. But we don't need to get saved all over again. Praise the Lord. You know how freeing that is? Have you ever been in a mindset where you thought maybe you need to get saved again? And then maybe later on you felt like you need to get saved again? That is not a comfortable way to live. And it's not living based on the truth either. You get saved once. Once and for all. And when you get saved, many things change in your life. Some folks claim to be saved and nothing's really changed. But when you get saved, everything changes. It begins to change. You don't become perfect. No. But you know the one who's perfect and you know he's saved and you know he's living in you and his Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit that you're a child of God. And so we watch each other's feet by loving one another and helping each other live clean. Clean. That was the purpose of feet washing. To clean. We've already been made clean, fit for heaven. I've married Jesus. Jesus has married me. When I say married, I ain't talking about no earthly marriage. I'm talking about an eternal marriage that God ordained and set in place. And when I married Jesus, when I got saved, I joined up with him and I got his righteousness. I don't need any more righteousness to go to heaven. I just need to let God work in me to live out his righteousness to be a blessing to others, but especially a blessing to one another. We are to love one another. How do we do that? We do that by washing each other's feet. How do you do that? Well, we follow the guidelines that the scriptures give us. We care for one another. We're honest with each other. We forgive each other. We teach each other the truth. We remind each other, as the song said, okay? We sing it again and again. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. And we're singing it again. Oh, what a Savior. And we're singing it again. We remind each other of the glories of living for Christ. But we also remind each other how to walk. And we can correct each other and edify one another. And we can remind one another. And we can demonstrate to others 
that when I'm in the wrong, I confess that, and I admit that. And if I've wronged you, I go to you and do that. I'm teaching you. That's not necessarily my purpose. My purpose is to get right with you. But in doing that, I'm teaching you as I'm living out the commands of Christ as well. And you're teaching me. I think that's how we wash one another's feet. We humbly put ourselves down and we below the other person and we care for them. There is none righteous, no, not one, but we are righteous in Christ. But there's no one who doesn't sin. We all do. And so we all need to confess at times. We all need to repent at times. And we all need to be forgiven and give forgiveness over and over again. And I believe the command that Jesus gave here to the disciples when he said, Now you've seen what I did. Now you need to do that to each other. And I don't think they went ran and got some water and a basin and started washing each other's feet right then. Jesus continued to teach them that you need to promote holy living with one another. What did Peter end up doing? That very night, later, Jesus had told Peter, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. But I prayed for you, Peter. I didn't pray that you wouldn't do that. I prayed for you that after you do that, then you come back to me and you'll teach your brothers what it's all about. So Peter denied the Lord three times that night. And he confessed and repented bitterly with tears. A demonstration to his brothers and sisters of how to respond when you've been opposed to God and when you haven't been obedient to God. Peter taught them by his own example. And so then he was able to teach and be a leader and a preacher for others. We, love, we wash one another's feet because we care that they don't keep going through life with their feet very nasty. But they live holy and clean. Spiritually speaking, I hope you understand what I'm saying. First Tim tells us that uh, every Christian no longer needs to be bathed and cleaned spiritually <coughs> for their soul because they've been washed through the blood of Jesus. Amen? That's already been done. But we, ever, we all need feet washing along the way. Look at verses 34 and 35. This is the teaching that Jesus gave them that same night. Look at verses 34 and 35. So Jesus said, I give you a new commandment. Love one another. Well, he, they'd already been told to do that. But in a new, deeper, freeing way, empowering through God's Spirit way. And Jesus said, Just as I have loved you, just as I have loved you, you must also love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. All of us who are believers, we are washed in the blood of the Lamb. And yet we do need feet washing. I need you. And you need each other. We all need each other. We all need it. And we are to love one another. We're to love one another to want to walk holy and want others to walk holy. We don't become the judge. We don't go snooping around like police. But in a way of interacting with one another, we promote God to live among ourselves. Right? And we do that by being an example. And Jesus' disciples were to learn this lesson over and over again. And so must we. We do that even from our church. And we're all concerned that we do not conform to the world, but we conform to Jesus. He's made us conformable in the sight of our Father. So now we need to live it out so that God can use us as a shining light to others. While watching and praying and loving and caring for one another, bearing one another's burdens. You know what? We can do this. We're commanded to. We're empowered to. And we can. I don't know how you need to apply it in your life. I keep learning new ways that I need to apply it in mine. We can do this, can't we? We can honor our Father. We can honor the Lord Jesus. We can live out through the working of His Holy Spirit. And we can do this. Romans 12.10 is a beautiful picture of what I'm talking about here. <clears throat> Romans 12.10 
It says to be kindly affectionate to one another. And we are to be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Or you could say preferring one another. Romans 12. Yeah. We're to honor each other by preferring each other and be kindly affectionate. So sometimes uh, in times past, the owner of the house would assign the duty, okay, you client, you are going to be my foot feet washing servant. You've got other jobs to do, but anytime a guest comes to my house, you make sure you wash their feet. But instead of that, that's not what we do. We do it ourselves, don't we? We're to wash each other's feet. We're to care for one another. In honor, preferring one another. So, to claim somebody is to encourage them to live godly, righteously, before the Lord. Because they remind us and they encourage us to do the same. Without judging others, but loving others. Now, what are you thinking? I don't know. Are you thinking that there's just some people <coughs> that you can't and probably never will be able to wash their feet? Is there anybody you think you just can't do that to? Then all I say is this. Tell that to Jesus. He washed Jesus the scariest feet. Knowing. Knowing what Jesus was going to do. Surely we can do it to each other. Let's bow for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I don't know everything that you have in the Scripture, but I thank you for what you show us. And I do know that caring for one another is part of what you set up for us to do. And it's a beautiful thing. It's, it's, it's gorgeous. It's just a power thing. That you would so work through us that we could be a blessing to one another. And encouragement to one another. Even a loving correction at times to one another. Lord, grant it to be so. Thank you for that. Do what you will. Lord, this is your word. May you honor it in your way for your glory. If there's somebody who has never trusted you, may they trust you right now. Right now, may they say, oh God, I thank you for Jesus. And I need you desperately. Please save me. Put me into Jesus. Give me forgiveness of my sins and eternal life. Lord, they can do that now. I pray they will. Or they can come to somebody up to somebody pray with them. Lord, if there's anybody who needs to be saved, I pray they'd be saved. Lord, that's the only way for any of us to be Christian. And I pray that you'd motivate those of us who know you to, to know what you want us to do. Be honored, Lord. Be glorified. Speak to us, Lord. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing 483, the Savior is waiting. Oh, Lord.